go sing on Jordan's Stormy Banks. Let's sing it out on the first. church. Sure is good to see you tonight. Here in the middle of the week, we get to get together. Isn't that good? Y'all be seated and choir y'all sing for us.
Amen. Let's all stand, church. Let's turn to page 327. Let's sing Springs of Living Water. Let's sing it out. I thirsted in a barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfied there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now and not, my soul is satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. How sweet the living water from the hills of God, it makes me glad and happy all the way. Now glory, grace, and blessing mark the path I trod, I'm shouting hallelujah every day. Drinking at the springs of living water, as it now and on, my soul is satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Oh, sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? A fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free, where thirsty spirits can be satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul is satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Long before the fall of man, God designed a master plan. He exchanged the sinner for the sinner's one. Jesus left his soul on high, made to earth and bleed and die. He said, Father, not my will, but thy be done. He is mine. He is mine. I am blessed beyond all measure. He is mine. I have parted full and free through the blood he shed for me. Say forever I shall be. He is mine. Through God's mercy and his grace, he prepares for us a place. Words cannot describe the matchless beauty there. We will praise his perfect plan. We of kings, the great I am. He has made the joys of heaven ours to share. He is mine. He is mine. I am blessed beyond all measure. He is mine. I have pardoned full and free through the blood he shed for me. Sing forever, I shall be. He is mine. He is mine. He is mine. He is mine. I am blessed beyond all measure. He is mine. I have pardoned full and free through the blood he shed for me. Sing forever, I shall be. He is mine. Hey Amen. I'm glad to know he's mine. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. And uh, if you'd continue to pray for Megan as she's having test run, I also pray for Mike Coward had sinus surgery today, and uh, Lou Barfield's in ICU. So if you'd pray for her, didn't know that till now. And then um, pray for our missionary Jennifer Bundy, Bundy, uh, who uh, I told you about. Uh, she's been waiting this long for surgery, still hadn't had it, and uh, they got clearance this morning. 
uh, for the insurance to pay 100%, but they've had to wait that long. She could be in surgery as we speak. Uh, she could have already had it. They Within 24 hours of getting the clearance, I've been in touch with them, so they're in Dubai, and, and so uh, pray for them. And then I, I uh, messaged John Flowers last night and this morning. There was a bad earthquake in Taiwan. I don't know if you heard about that. And uh, John told me he and April, their family's fine. Uh, they're, they're up north in Taiwan. They've, of course, felt it, and there's damage in their area, but they're okay. But pray for them. And then Darlene Jones' mother, Shirley Jones, uh, is not doing well. So if you'd please pray for her when we pray tonight uh, as well. Our offering uh, on Wednesday nights, and let me explain a little bit. Uh, for a long time, we've done $1 bill offerings. This doesn't affect, I'm just going to talk about me. This doesn't affect my tithe. This doesn't affect, affect my faith promise. This doesn't affect what I give to radio, anything. Uh, everybody can give a dollar. Teenagers can figure out a way to give a dollar. Children can figure out a way. And so all the $1 bills we've used for a long time go to Bibles. Well, now we're, we're going to be feeding some, some national preachers uh, that are in the Middle East. And uh, I just know they're, I know they're struggling. I can't say more than that. But uh, we're going to uh, use these $1 bills, and we're going to use it to help buy food uh, and other things that are needed uh, for these families in the Middle East that are serving the Lord. So all the $1 bills. My problem on Wednesday is remember to get cash. I get it. But, uh, but uh, that's what I have to remember to do. But uh, we're going to do that. Brother Zach, lead us in prayer, and then let's give together tonight. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time that we can come together once again in your house to worship you. Lord, how wonderful it is to know that you are mine. Lord, I, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you'd be with the remainder of the service. Bless the offering and bless the, the rest of the singing and the preaching. Pray that everything that is said and done will be to your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Let's sing this chorus. Oh, get sweeter as the days go by. It gets sweeter as the moments fly. His love is richer.
Amen. Let's go to the longest chapter in the Bible tonight, Psalm 119. I can't figure out what series to do next, so I just thought I'd preach the longest chapter in the Bible. And, and uh, sometimes I'll confess as a preacher, this, this is normal. I talk to other preacher friends, and you come to a point sometimes you, you, you know, when you're teaching Sunday school, and of course I teach Sunday school as well, and you know, at least something's given to you that you have a starting place. Sometimes when you're preaching and you preach three times a week, teach Sunday school, and you look at the Bible sometimes and go, God, what do they need? You know, and you just beg God that you, that you get it right. Uh, of course, then sometimes you have to remind yourself it's all good. You mean, you can turn anywhere and it'll be okay. And, uh, but I'm not going to preach the whole psalm. I want you to go all the way to the very last section. And uh, that'd be Psalm 119, verse 169. The foundation to our doctrine is God's Word. We take that for granted. We take the Bible for granted. We really do. We, we all have a Bible, most in this room, not everybody, but most of you have grown up with a Bible. Most of you have had one all your life. You don't think anything about it. It would be totally foreign to you to think of someone in the world who has never owned a Bible. They've never possessed a Bible. I have been in countries, and I've got to get back to them uh, just to help me feel like I'm doing what God's part of the ministry God's called me to do. But the, um, I remember being in Romania on the first and second trips, and we were passing out Bibles. And I would watch people literally take their Bible, and I'm talking, I'm not talking about a Bible like, like you're holding or a Bible like I, I preach from. I'm talking a paperback Bible that you might find at the Dollar Tree. You might pay, I mean, you'll find them on clearance, you, you know, for, for a dollar. And we would, we would have those because we could get them over there. And uh, you would see people take these Bibles and, and weep and sit down and cry because they had never held a Bible before. They'd not, under communism, they'd not been allowed to have a Bible. And I've not seen this. We had enough when we were there, we were able to give everyone a, a Bible of their own. I've been told by missionaries that there have been times they didn't have enough Bibles to give out, and that they would sit down and they would find the book divisions and they would start tearing the Bible into sections so that they could give their friends a section of the Bible, you know, because they had nothing. And we just, we just really take it for granted. And I mean, I realize we live in a world, too, that rejects the Bible. But to everything we believe, church, we must have a love for the Scriptures. We cannot take it for granted. We cannot neglect it. I know the world attacks it. I I, uh, I do research, I watch stuff, I read stuff, and I, I, I would read and watch things that would argue against what we believe, and I would never tell anybody else to do it. You say, why do you do it, preacher? Sometimes I want to know what people are saying so that I can defend you, and, and so that I can defend things that are being said. And um, I literally heard a man say that it didn't matter about the translations, that the more liberal your, your translation, the better you were. And, uh, I mean, I've heard things like that. I'm going to say that's a lie uh, because what we've done is we've made the Word of God's validity based upon man's opinion rather than God's truth. And so we need to understand that. But the Bible that, that I hold in my hand, I would not preach from it if I did not believe that it was and is truly the Word of God. I need the Bible. But I want to give you some evidence as I've given you before. Tonight's sermon is one of my, this, this is common for me. I have a really long introduction and a very short sermon. When people say that I preach long sermons, I really don't. I preach long introductions. And you need to remember that. I preach short sermons. I just have long, inter I just have a hard time getting to the sermon is, is what happens. But uh, tonight you'll see where I'm going. But let me give you some things I've given you before. How, what are some evidences for the Bible? 
what are, what are some things that we as Christians... Now, uh, let, let me just give you a few. The first one is very important, though a skeptic would reject it. But the first one I would say is, the, the, one of the things I would say that, that, that would give me evidence for the Bible is the Bible's claim for itself. Now, like I say, a skeptic would not accept that. But if the Bible did not claim to be the Word of God, on what basis would we have to say it is the Word of God? There must be first a claim, not just me claiming it, but the Word of God itself. Now, there's many scriptures, and you can do cross-references on this scripture. Uh, My wife brought it up this morning, something our discipleship uh, that I would use this verse that uh, if we were dealing with this in our in our discipleship uh, life to life, but Second Timothy three sixteen, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. The word inspiration there means to be breathed of God. It means to be literally out of the breath of God. All scriptures given by inspiration, the breath of God, and is profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for reproof for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, how many, I, 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 don't raise your hand to this, but how many really believe that your doctrine, what you believe is important? It's not just a matter of, of having a Bible. It's not just a matter of, of saying, well, you know, uh, these people over here believe this and these people over here believe this and we're all just going to heaven. There's many roads to, no, 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 no. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And if there's any doctrine that takes salvation away from it being Christ alone, there's a problem. Okay, so, so there. But then there's other doctrines. You say, preacher, what about other doctrines that don't necessarily, that, you know, does it mean that someone's not going to go to heaven if they don't believe exactly like us? Absolutely not. There are differences of opinion on other doctrines, but when it comes to the doctrines of salvation... If you think you're saved by water baptism, you're lost. If you think you're saved by works, you're lost. If you think you're saved by anything other than the grace of God and you think somehow you can earn it and go to heaven, I would, I would sure make sure that my election was sure that I'm saved, that I'm a child of God. But then the, it says it's profitable for doctrine. Then it says it's profitable for reproof. Now, you've got the word after that for correction, Those aren't the same thing. Correction, we understand. What's reproof? The Word of God is profitable to, and and I'm going to change the word to another form of that word. The Word of God reproves itself. You say, what do you mean? The Word of God gives you evidences over and over for itself. Reprove. Over again, proves itself to be correct. Reproof means it takes us back. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. I was given a number the other day that, that, that appears to be a contradiction. There's 50 answers of, what, of how it would fit. You say, preacher, which one is it? I don't know. I just know it's not a contradiction. You say, why? Because it wasn't up to me. To, to, it's never been up to us to keep the Word of God. Uh, God is, is powerful enough to do that. And so instruction in righteousness. How do we know how to live? Now, Here's a real problem in this verse, not for the Bible, for us. Our world today, and, and I'm going to be real blunt, there's people that I preach to all the time that do not believe this book when it comes to instruction and in righteousness. Something clear in this book, we will take our culture and we will disagree with what's in the Bible based on our culture and, if, and, and here's what happens, and I jokingly said this to If Mark's watching, he'll appreciate me saying his name. Uh, I, I've jokingly said this to Mark numerous times. You know, if you preach something that goes against the culture and goes against something somebody wants to do, you're a legalist. If you preach against sin today, you're a legalist. There is, there is a movement going on. I, I've seen this recently. There are people who want a doctrine that has no authority. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me how to do it. I want to do as I please, when I please, how I please, like I please. And if I think it's right or wrong, you better preach it. But don't you preach anything that I think is against anything that I think is okay. 
That is the world we live in. Because we don't like authority. If this book says it, it is profitable for instruction in righteousness. And you need to follow God's word. Following it now, if, if I'm adding something that there's no biblical basis for it, I get it. But when there's a biblical basis for it, follow the book. Follow the book and, and do that. And so the Bible's claim for itself that it, all Scripture is given by the breath of God, we must see that first. Number two, the re, an evidence I'd see for the Bible, are the confirmations by Christ. Now, even skeptical historians admit Christ was on the earth. They, don't they won't admit he was God like I know he was. And, and, and should I say, like I know he is. Okay, he is God. There are people who say they believe this book, and they claim that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are either allegorical or a myth. If they claim that, and they say they believe this book, if I could say this graciously, they're liars. You say, graciously? Yeah, I could get meaner than that. Um. You say you believe the Bible, and you're going to say Jesus lied? You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, the first 11 chapters deal with Adam and Eve, and Jesus talked about Adam and Eve as if they were real people. Can you believe that? Uh, Jesus talked about Noah. So you're going to tell me that Noah was allegorical, but Jesus talks about him as if he's real? See, that's evidence for the Word of God, because here's Jesus giving us evidence. Now, Jesus called the Bible, the Scriptures, the Word of God, in Mark chapter 7, 13, John chapter 10, verse 35. He calls, Jesus called the Bible Scripture in Luke 4, 21, John 5, 39, and 10, 35. And he called it the commandment of God in Mark 7 and verse 8. Over and over and over, he would tell them that if they had believed Moses or if they had believed the prophets, they'd have believed on him. He constantly referred to the Old Testament, and he referred to the Old Testament as it being valid and true because it is. So I have those first two things, I, the Bible's claim and Christ's claim. Jesus, uh, Jesus accepted the people of, of the Old Testament as real people. He quoted, uh, Genesis, he quoted Genesis, Exodus, Isaiah, Deuteronomy, and Psalms. And th that's just to start off. He quoted those. And, and so we see that. But then we think about its hi hi historical ac accuracy. Uh, many love history, but deny the Bible. Uh, I, 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 don't, I really don't debate much anymore. I, I try to keep in my mind things that are going on, but I don't have time to. I, I'm, I'm here to, to serve you. I'm here to preach to you. Uh, I don't have time to argue with somebody else. And, and so I'm not going to do, I, I, I just don't have time for it. But, but I think about the, the, you talk to somebody and, and they, if you were going to talk to a, a, a secular scientist, and they want to use their science books, but you can't use the Bible. That's weird rules, isn't it? You got to, you know, they get to use their book, but we don't. But even in history, there are, I, I, was, I was listening to a lecture recently by a man who was debating uh, a skeptic, and the skeptic admitted this, that the Gospels, though he did not believe they were Scripture, he accepted them as history because the men who wrote those Gospels lived during the time of the events that occurred, and any logical person would accept the writings of someone who lived in the time, but he just felt they were biased. But he still had to look at it because a lot of the history that was written in the Gospels, you have other places. And, and so uh, you have that. The Old and New Testaments are filled with references to specific people, places, events. Archaeology has confirmed many. I, I remember Malcolm, who uh, is one of our guides in Israel, and, and he, he's a Jewish man, lives there, and I pray for him. He's there right now. He was the first one that ever made this statement to me. He said that, uh, that archaeology or, or arche the archaeology does not prove the Bible. The Bible proves archaeology. And he made this statement to me. He said, any archaeologist, even if he's an atheist, 
If he's an archaeologist in that section of the world worth his salt, he has a Bible in his backpack because it's the best map that he'll find. And, and, and these are secular people that would say that. And Nelson Luke wrote this at one time. He said, no archaeological find has ever disputed the Scriptures. Now think about that. I mean, they have found places of, 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 of sacrifice in the exact places. I remember last time we were there, uh, we, for the first time, and probably the last time, unless somehow the border got better, it's just harder, hard to go across the border, it took too much time. And uh, I don't like that because it means you see less sights, and I want to see as much as I can. And uh, because I got people with me, but we were standing on Mount Nebo, and and I'm reading the scriptures, and and uh, you know if I'm standing here on Mount Nebo, and and I'm right on the edge, I'm up on the top, and uh, I wish I, I wish I'd have been the bus driver. Just throw that in for you, but because I was praying for this driver, he couldn't drive. But anyway. Uh, we're up at the very top of Mount Nebo, and I read the scriptures, and it tells me that Moses dies at the top of Mount Nebo over against Jericho. I'm standing on Nebo, and I'm looking at Jericho. It was that precise. You say, does that really matter? Maybe they went over there and... and and wrote that, wait, 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 wait a minute. You, remember, you realize those books were written, <laughs> those books were written 3,500, 4, 4,000 years ago. And, and now we're going to be skeptics and say, well, somebody might have gone over there and figured out Nebo and figured out they could see Jericho. No, 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 no. Remember, God took Moses to, to the top of Nebo to show him the land that he wasn't going to be able to enter because he struck the rock twice. Then he dies there, and the Bible tells you where he is when he dies. And now, today, 3,500, 4,000 years later, you can go to that spot, and it's still the spot. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I, can, I, I could take you places there that I would tell you that I won't tell you this is the spot, but I can tell you from evidence this is the area. I remember one time we were at Beth Barah, uh, the, the name of it today, they call it Kasser El Yehud, which means the cutting of the waters. We're there, and, and it, it's also Beth Barah, which is the place where John the Baptist was baptizing when Jesus came, and they were baptizing him. Uh, I, I began to study this, and it didn't say anything. So when I get there, my next trip, because I always study, and I, I always look for something extra, and the next trip, we're there. And, and so I'm there, and I said, let me tell you some things that happened here at Jordan. And I went through and I said, the children of Israel crossed in this area. But that's why it's called Qasr el Yahud. The, the Jews and the Muslims call it the same location, the, places, the place where the waters were cut open. Isn't that amazing? It's still called that today. So I get to looking at it. And then I looked at Elijah. And Elijah, go read this. You want a Bible study? Let me give you one. Go look at Elijah when he's going to go up in the fiery chariot. He doesn't go up from Israel. He goes up from Jordan. And if you will do what he does, he backtracks, not perfectly, but he backtracks in the Scriptures. It tells you where he goes. And he kind of goes backwards until he gets to the journey of the children of Israel when they first got into Israel. And he goes that area. And then he goes and crosses the Jordan River where they crossed. Which means Qasr el Yahud is the area where Elijah crossed. He goes across and, and he goes up in the fiery chariot. He, 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 and Elisha sees it. His mantle falls. According to the prophecy of Elisha, or Elijah, Elisha is given a double portion. He takes the mantle of his, of his father in the ministry. He takes the mantle of, of Elijah. He, Elisha goes back to the same place in the water and says, Wherefore is the, the Lord God of, of Elijah smites the water? They open again. He walks across there. There's where the people uh, told him. He started telling them that Elijah had gone up in a fiery chariot. No doubt it tells us that he tore his clothes and mourned. I believe he shaved his head because many times that's what they would do in mourning. What did the, what did the, the young people that were making fun of him say? They told him, go up, thou bald head. They said, won't you go with Elijah? We don't want to hear what you say. 
We don't want to hear. And then the she bears came out and ate them. Then a man comes from Syria and had leprosy. Anybody remember his name? Naaman. Elisha doesn't do what he wants. He wants Elisha to come out like a faith healer, smack him on the head, and him be done with it. Elisha tells him to go wash in the Jordan seven times. Now, here's the interesting thing. Anybody remember, and I've taught y'all this, so you should get it. Anybody remember Naaman's complaint? It was what? It was muddy. Not just dirty. It was muddy. Did you know the upper Jordan by the Sea of Galilee is blue, clean, beautiful? But then after it comes out of the Sea of Galilee and it goes down through the Jordan Valley and it goes, it'll get real little, then it'll get bigger, then it gets little, then it becomes, and really the Jordan River is about the size of the middle section here. And by the time you get down to Kasser El Yehud, would you believe it's muddy? Would you believe in that same place? It's, it's muddy. Why wouldn't Elisha send him to where he'd seen God open the waters? Why wouldn't he send him where he'd seen God move before? And Naaman said, well, I can go back and cl do clean waters. And he said, no, it's those muddy waters. And then you get to the New Testament and you find out the same area is where Jesus was baptized. I tell all of that. We're standing at Kasser El Yehud and George is there. I taught my whole crowd. That was my lesson a lot longer. That was my lesson there standing on the shore of the Jordan River on that trip. We're walking back to the bus and George goes, Pastor, I got a question for you. You've not, and at that point I had not been. He said, you haven't been to Jordan. I said, no. He said, have you researched Jordan? I said, no. He said, Pastor, less than a quarter mile across the Jordan River is the traditional site of Elijah's hill where Elijah went up. He said, how'd you know that? I said, it's easy. I've got a Bible. He said, you got that in the Bible? I said, yeah. Do you understand the Bible is true historically? I mean, it's true. It's prophetic accuracy. Judgment on cities like Tyre and, and, and Babylon, Sodom and Gomorrah. You realize Sodom and Gomorrah is where the Dead Sea is. Why do you think all those minerals are there? All this fire and brimstone falling? And, and there's even archaeologists. This is amazing. There are archaeologists that outside just south of the Dead Sea, you know what they find all the time on the ground? Sulfur balls. They're little balls about this big, and you can take a match and light them, and they'll fire up because that area was destroyed. There's even a statue. The people over there accept it. There's a statue to Lot's wife. I mean, they, they don't even deny it. You say, what do you mean, preacher? The Bible's that true. Uh, and by the way, if past prophecy is proven true with the Scriptures, uh, when Christ came, there were at least 60 prophecies that he fulfilled from the Old Testament. So, so if, if that, I, what was the, I heard, I heard or read this statement this week somewhere I was reading. It said that prophecy is the future history of the world. You say, why? Because God's already settled it. Prophecy is the future history of the world. And, and if, if other prophecies have come true, don't you believe this book is still true enough for the rest to come true? Why? Because it's the Word of God. So I've got the Bible's claim, the, the Christ confirmation, historical accuracy. This is all introduction. Hang on. Prophetic accuracy, textual unity. I've told you this a bunch, so I'll ask you, how many authors are there of the Bible? How many? Around 40. I heard somebody say it. How many continents was the Bible written from? You said it. Anybody else want to say it? Three. Three different continents. Um, how many languages was the Bible written in? Three. Hebrew, Hebrew and Greek is what we say first, but we forget that both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are some Aramaic. 
you could argue a fourth one because part of Daniel could have been in Chaldean, and, uh, but then it would have been taken to Hebrew. And you, you say, well, preacher, what about the originals? We don't have originals. We have ancient text, but it's God who preserves his word, not man. And so we have to remember that. But then think about this. We, we got 40 authors, three continents written over a period of 1,500 years, three languages, and then you got writers from these backgrounds. You've got Jeremiah was a prophet, Zechariah was a priest, Amos was a shepherd, David was a king, Nehemiah was a servant to a king, Luke was a doctor, Matthew's a tax collector, Paul was a Pharisee, Peter and John were fishermen, James and Jude were half-brothers of Jesus, and 400 years separated the Old Testament from the New Testament. And it all still agrees. You have 66 books that becomes one book. And it's a book you can trust. See, there is no way you could rig that. I've heard people say, well, Christianity is just a made-up religion. You cannot make that come together. Only God could do something like that. And say, I want you, young people, I want you to know these things because your faith's going to be challenged. But the fact is, are you going to let them challenge you when those kind of things are true? Uh, do you understand that there's, a, that unlike any other religion, now, and, and I mean, and your preachers looked at it, I'm not telling you, you you have to. Other religions will name places that don't even exist. There are religions that claim Jerusalem that don't even have Jerusalem in their book. It's not even there. And, 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 and yet, the Bible tells you how Jerusalem came about. It tells you who lived there before the Israelites did. It tells you where it's at. It tells you how God's going to use it. You find out Mount Moriah's there. You learn all of these different things, and you realize that the Word of God is one book. It's a book you can trust, and it's true. So we've got the Bible's claims, Christ confirmations, historical accuracy, prof prophetic accuracy, textual unity. And lastly, how about the impact of the Bible? How about the impact of the Word of God on the world? Name another book in all of human history that has... Im I'm not talking about another book that people knew about. I'm not talking about another book that somebody read. I'm not talking about another book that somebody knew its tenets and its doctrines. No. Name a book that's had the impact on the world that the Bible has. I, I mean, I think about the men and women of the Bible, the historical people, the writings they're recorded. I think about the founding of our nation and how this book affected the founding of, of even England. England and America both. And now think about the, the, the impact of England and America around the world. I mean, and, and it, was all affected by, it was all affected by the Bible and even more. Think about the, the influence. Not today they want it out, but you understand the original schools in our country were in the church. Education was done with the Bible. And, and, and uh, Harvard and Yale and Princeton and the Ivy League schools, they used to be Bible colleges. That's what they were. And I think about the influence on education. I think about the influence on, on our own communities where there were churches. Uh, they'd go into a community, and the most important building they were going to build in that community was a church. That, that was going to be the center of, of, of the community. And, and, and so the Word of God would, would do that. Then I think about missions around the world. And what did missions bring? Missions brought humanitarian aid. Where did humanitarian aid come from? Uh, could I, do you know why America's the first nation to help when there's a tragedy in the world? Even liberals do. You know why? Because in the founding of our nation, we were charitable to help those that needed help. We did mission work. Mission work meant you build hospitals. Think of the hospitals around the world that would not exist had it not been for this book. Because that, that's, that's I, I mean, Christianity is, the most, Christianity is the most hated religion in the world, and yet it's the most benevolent ministry in the world. Do you understand what I'm telling you is true? And, and, and yet it continues. You say, I want some validity. Look at it. It's just logical that you see it all. I, I, I heard something even today. I heard a recording today where a liberal said this about the Bible. He said that the, and he actually said the King James Bible. 
He said the King James Bible has affected the English language more than any other book in history. And then we worry about the ye and you and the the and the thou. You know, and he's saying it affected the languages. Hadn't seen anybody say we need to to, uh, rewrite Shakespeare. But anyway, uh, but most of all to me, could I tell you this? You say, preacher, why do you believe the Bible's true? Well, I've got all those things I just told you. But this book has saved my life. This book has, this book has impacted me. Now, that doesn't prove it to anybody else, but it proves it to me. Now, Psalm 119 is a mosaic central to the theme of the Word of God. And this, how many of y'all remember that Psalm is a book of songs? They would sing them. Well, Psalm 119 was a very long song. It had 22 stanzas. Each stanza was named after a letter from the Hebrew alphabet. First one was Aleph, and it ends at the, what we're going to read in just a minute, Tav, and that's the very last one. That's the last section. It's also the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Each verse in the stanzas begins with the letter of that Hebrew letter in the stanzas heading. Now, God is mentioned in, in, in Psalm 119, God is mentioned in every verse. And the Word of God is mentioned in 173 out of 176 verses. There's 70 prayer requests. The psalmist refers to himself 325 times. He mentions suffering in 66 verses. He's resolved to know, to keep, the, and love the law of God. Now, we are come to the very last section, the 22nd section. Uh, the, the, we, 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 we come to Tav. We come to, to the last one. And this last one is in three parts. And I've got to do these three parts to get to my message because I'm still not to my message. I'm still in the introduction, Okay. And so read with me, let my cry come near before thee, O Lord, give me understanding according to thy word. Let my supplication come before thee, deliver me according to thy word. My lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. My tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments are righteousness. Let thine hand help me for I have chosen thy precepts. I have longed for thy salvation, O Lord, and thy law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise thee, and let thy judgments help me. I have gone astray let a, uh, like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. Just in this last section, I've got the word, the word, the statutes, the commandments, the precepts, uh, the law, uh, the, uh, uh, the judgments, and then in the last one, thy commandments. And so in each one, you see that. So real quick, the first thing you see in verses, still not in the sermon, verses 169, 170, you see a prayer. There's a desire here for discernment. God, I need understanding. God, God, I I need understanding according to thy word. God, give me understanding. It's like Daniel in Daniel chapter 2. And he changeth the time of the seasons. He removed the kings and set it up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them at that no understanding. The psalmist here said, I need understanding. In verse 170, he says, uh, let my prayer, let my supplication come before thee. Deliver me. I, I need deliverance. He said, I, I need deliverance. Uh, uh, here in, in this verse, he says, let my supplication come before thee. Deliver me according uh, to thy word. Uh, Lord, let your word deliver me. Let your word testify. That's what the word there means. It, let it testify. Yeah, uh, let, let thy word, let my, or my lips shall utter, verse 171, my lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. My tongue shall speak of thy word. Let me, because I've got your understanding, uh, let me testify uh, of those things. I need deliverance, but I need, uh, I, I need to testify. I will praise you. Uh, I need to testify. I will pour out. Uh, I will give thanks. The word utter means to pour out. 
And, and so he says, I've got my prayer. I need, I need, I have a desire for you to give me understanding. I have a desire for you to give me deliverance. And if you give me deliverance, then, Lord, I'm going to praise you in Psalm 171. My lips will utter your praise. Why would he do that? Because the word of God brings him to a place that he would praise the Lord. You know, I, I, I dare say this. Maybe we don't praise the Lord because we don't read our Bibles. Maybe the praise of God's not on our lips because we would say, like the psalmist did in 169 and verse 70, I need, I need deliverance and I need understanding. We'll say that. How many of y'all think you'd, if you feel like you need deliverance, you'll ask God for it? How many of you need understanding? No, you're at least supposed to ask God for it. Okay, we know that. But then he says, my lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. That's the word of God. My tongue shall speak of thy word for all the commandment or righteousness. He, he, and, 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 and then we wonder why we don't praise God like we should Again, maybe we don't praise the Lord because we're not in the Bible. Maybe we're weak in praising God because we're not in His Word. But then in verse 172, he goes, go back there, he says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. He said, I'm going to speak. This again means to testify. It means to testify as a witness, to give an answer, to testify of grace. And so we... We, I never gave the name of the sermon. John did put it up for you. But this is the, this, the one that wrote the psalm. You find out in the very last section he was a struggling sheep. We, we can't be sure when he wrote it. Uh, we don't know for sure when it was written. Uh, some, some believe that it was written at different times. But we do know this. We know that he was struggling, and he said in verse 173, go there, and I'm almost to the sermon. He said, let thine hand help me. He said, God, I don't, I don't just need understanding, and I'm not just going to praise you. He said, but God, I need your hand. My hands are too weak. Now listen, I underlined this because I didn't want to miss it, because I've skipped part of it because i got the... Master clubs will be here in a minute. So I got in a hurry. And I'm not to the sermon yet. But I, uh, I wrote this down. 173, let thine hand help me. We have numerous people in our church that are praying for somebody that's running from God. I know because I pray with you. And today while I was studying... And I looked at this verse, let thy hand help me for, for I've, I've chosen thy precepts. Let thy hand help me. I'm going to tell you, and you may already pray this way, but I'm going to add, tell you something to add to your prayer. Our hands are weak, and theirs are too. So I wonder if we ought to pray, God, put them in a place. And this would be a hard prayer to pray. Put them in a place where the only thing they can get is to ask for your hand. Put them in a place that they need your hand, but they have no answers. Because the psalmist here said, I've got to have your hand, God. I, 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 I need your hand. He said, and by the way, I, I, that could be a hand of touch, but it, it says I need your hand to help me. He said, I need your hand to help me. God, I need your help. Verse 175, look at that one. Verse 175, he said, I need your hope. But 176 is my sermon. Just one verse. You needed to know this desperation. You needed to know about the Bible. You needed to know that for 175 verses... This psalmist has been talking about his love for the Word of God, his need for the Word of God, his desire for the Word of God. And for us to even get that, we had to understand why we believe the Word of God. All of that's just the big porch of the house we built tonight to tell you one thing. Verse, verse 176 is the testimony of a struggling sheep. 
For 175 verses, he's made confession to God. And now he makes a confession about himself. I've gone astray like a lost sheep. For 175 verses, God, I want your word. I want your commandments. I want your statutes. I need you. And he gets to verse 176. And you find out why he wrote the other 175 verses. Lord, I've gone astray. And I've only got one hope. No, look, are y'all in verse 176? Amen. He said, I've gone astray. Look at it. Like a lost sheep. He didn't say he's lost. He didn't say God had forgotten him. This was his fault. But he said, I've gone astray like a lost sheep. And let me say this quickly. He said, God, I need your help, verse 174. God, I need your hope, verse 175. But then he says this. He said, I've gone astray. I'm in danger. I'm like a lost sheep. I can't do anything. Would you look at verse 176 and look what he says? He says, Lord, I'm so weak. I don't even feel like I can come to you. God, would you come looking for me? This struggling sheep said, I went astray. Lord, would you come looking for me? Lord, would you come find me where I am? Lord, would you come running after me? This is literally the sheep crying to the shepherd to be found in its dependence. He said, would you seek me? He said, because all I got left, look at it. Psalm 176 is the sermon, and it's the whole Psalm 119. It's the whole picture of Psalm 119. He said, I've run astray. He said, would you come looking for me? Because all I've got left is I hadn't forgotten your commandments. And that's all I've got. He said, I need you. So our plea sometimes as wandering sheep must come before the Lord because we love Him. Listen to me, church. If you really love Him, you're going to love His Word. You say, preacher, I'm not reading my Bible. And how do you love God? Preacher, I'm not reading my Bible. And how do you praise? How do you worship? That's the foundation to it. Even this one that's backslidden and confesses by inspiration of the Holy Spirit that they've gone astray. The whole focus was the Word of God. So in good times, we can cry out, we need our God. In hard times, we can testify, we need the Savior. And in failure times, we can call out, we need our shepherd. But only because of the promises of the Word of God. Do you believe his promises? Do you believe they're true? Then if you're lost tonight, come to Jesus and obey his command to believe on him. Accept his call to accept him as your savior. Don't die and go to hell because you think you can go to heaven your way. You can only go to heaven God's way, and that means you must repent. You must turn to Him. You must call on Him. You must believe with your heart that He died and rose again. If you're lost, come to Jesus. If you're here tonight or listening on the radio or watching, if you're wayward, get your heart right tonight and run to Jesus. Not because this preacher said to, but because you believe this book is true. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You say, preacher, how do you know it? Because that's out of this book. 
If you're wayward tonight, if you're lost, repent. If you're wayward, repent. Confess your sin and run to God. And you say, preacher, what if I'm right with God, but I'm going through a storm? Then cry out to God to help you and seek the shepherd because the shepherd is enough. And if you're redeemed tonight, rest in the shepherd and testify of your God. Because all of Psalm 119 comes down to one thing. There was a struggling sheep of God, one of his children that needed him. And all they had was they believed in the word. They felt like they had nothing else. And on the basis of their faith in the word of God, they cried out, God, you're all I need. Come looking for me. Let's bow in prayer. I don't know your need. I know what some pray for. But I would ask you, do you love the word? All of us at times have struggled. Maybe not reading like we should. We, this world just gets in our gets our attention this world draws us draws our mind away we get listen you know how it is you get tired and if you're not real careful the one thing you'll leave out is his word how are you going to run to him in trouble if you don't love his word what is it that's in his word that you need that you missed it because you weren't reading and as his child, have you testified to anybody else of the goodness of God in your life that you learned through his word? If the Lord spoke to your heart tonight, come find you a spot. If you need to be saved, call on Jesus. If you want us to pray with you, you meet us in this altar. Let's stand together. And if you'd like to pray tonight as we sing, would you come? Just as I